From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Good morning and welcome to Montana This Morning on this Friday, March 1st. I'm Augusta McDonald. More than a thousand police officers are expected in Sheridan, Wyoming today for the funeral of Sergeant Nevada Crinky. Crinky died two weeks ago after he was shot and killed while serving a trespass warning. It will be a service fit for a hero, they say, and the culmination of a few very challenging and heartbreaking weeks for the department. This morning, our Charlie Klepp speaks with Sheridan's police chief for the first time since that tragedy. It'll be here at the Bruce Hoffman Golden Dome in Sheridan, Wyoming, where Nevada Crinky's funeral service will be held on Friday. It'll also include a lengthy procession through town as the community gets its final chance to pay respects to Crinky. From the onset, it was obvious that he was someone who only ever wanted to serve. Sergeant Crinky was more than an officer to those he served with in the Sheridan Police Department. He was a colleague, a friend, and even a husband. His wife, Carla, is a corporal with the Sheridan PD. He did everything he could to make this the best community that he could. Police Chief Travis Colteska still struggles to talk about Crinky's death. He gave us everything. Uh, he gave the community, he gave his family, he gave this department everything, every day. And that love is also evident at this memorial on the department lawn, one that continues to grow by the day. How much do you think you guys will, will truly miss his presence here? I, I can't even describe that. I, I um, yeah, that's, that's, I don't think he'll be, ever be able to be replaced. Law enforcement officers from Wyoming, Montana, and beyond have already started to arrive for Friday's funeral, with more than a thousand expected. It's important to show up for your brothers and sisters and just be here. Detective Eric Brown and his partner drove the 15 hours from Whatcom County, Washington. It's a tragedy and people are grieving and um, I think Humans just need other humans to show up and, uh, and be there for him. Brown says the long drive would never deter him from supporting his law enforcement family and that he's been inspired by how supportive the entire community of Sheridan is. It's incredible to see and it's, I've only been here a short few hours, but it seems like you have a great community here that supports law enforcement. And that's why Colteska says the department will do their best to move on, keeping Crinky in mind every step of the way. We're constantly looking for that person that fits the mold that Nevada created. And, and that's how I kind of look at it is he really, he created a mold and we need to try to, to find out how to replicate that. In Sheridan, Charlie Kleps, MTN News. Great story. Thank you, Charlie. The Sheridan community is expected to line the streets today as the sergeant is escorted through town to the funeral service, which is on the Sheridan College campus where we just saw Charlie. Here's a map of the procession route. It's going to begin at the intersection of 11th and Main Street at 12 p.m. right near the Sheridan Police Department. And then it's going to head south on Main Street through the city's downtown before turning left onto Coffeen Avenue to the entrance of Sheridan College and the Golden Dome. KTVQ will be there and we will broadcast Sergeant Crinky's funeral live. Our coverage starts at 1 p.m. You can find it by downloading the Q2 app or by watching our MTN channel, which you can find at 2.2 or at channel 5 on DirecTV. Again, that service starts at 1 p.m. today and we will be there. And here is a live look right now of the Sheridan Main Street. It is going to be packed there today. Miller, lots of folks coming into town. What can they expect? Well, we're looking at at least partly cloudy skies. There is a very slight chance we could see some rain with temperatures in the upper 40s during that procession. Right now, you can see it's pretty quiet out there uh, in Sheridan. Uh, pulling back, though, what's coming? Well, we do have a line of snow uh, to our north and to our west, slowly starting to make its way here into Yellowstone County. Billings, we're going to see some of that snow as we go along this morning. Really no accumulation, not much of an impact with that. The, war, the roads are pretty warm out there, and we're just going to have a chance of rain and snow through the weekend. Uh, so uh, that's round number one, a second cold front coming through. That's going to cool us down on uh, Sunday. Actually, we could be a little warmer than average tomorrow, uh, before that next cold front comes through. Speaking of warmer than average, yesterday a good 12 degrees above the norm got up to about 55, 17 degrees above average, our overnight low of 39. Uh, yeah, yesterday, the last couple of days, of course, the big story, the winds, the good news is, uh, even though we had gusts of 37 miles an hour yesterday, uh, we still had some stronger winds around Livingston, around 60. That is calming down now. That cold front coming through is kind of squashing out uh, the uh, the wind, but could pick back up again on the back end as we get into the weekend. Uh, moisture totals doing okay for the month, wrapped up on a high note, 
And uh, we got more moisture coming through with that rain and snow. Uh, again, just little to no accumulation actually anticipated with it though. 36 right now at the airport. Feels like 31. Winds out of the northeast at about 6 miles an hour. Temperatures in the uh, mainly in the 30s right now. Highs mainly in the 40s today. Some 50s tomorrow. And then we're really going to cool down with that next system coming through. We will take a look at that with that main forecast coming up here in just a bit. All right, Miller. Thank you so much. And we continue to follow concerns surrounding the cleanup of the Yellowstone River from last year's train derailment near Reed Point. That derailment which happened in late June sent 10 rail cars tumbling into the water along with hundreds of thousands of pounds of asphalt. Crews have already recovered more than 200, uh, over 230,000 pounds of that with phase two of the cleanup process set to begin in the near future. But as our David Jay reports, questions continue to swirl around the environmental impact. Crews recovered about half of the asphalt spilled into the Yellowstone River because of the train derailment. That was all in phase one of the cleanup. The Unified Command says it may be able to find a little bit more as it moves into the next phase later this year. About 231,000 pounds of asphalt have been removed along a 131 mile stretch of the Yellowstone River. So we got over 50% last year and we're happy with that. Larry Alheim at the Montana Department of Environmental Quality says 30% is considered successful for many oil spills. Now he says it's on to phase two. We rapidly go down the river from the incident site to as far as we are seeing any asphalt. We look to see what changes to the river there have been because there's always changes to the Yellowstone. We look for any asphalt that we can find during that rapid assessment and if we find asphalt we call in an operations team to come and get it. But some still have questions. Our concern as an environmental and maintaining public access along the Yellowstone River is the damage. It isn't just picking up tar balls. Jill Hickson of the Yellowstone River Parks Association has written letters to the Unified Command. We are users of the riverbanks and, and anything that affects the river affects us. It's, our, it's a natural resource of the people of Montana and we're, we're here to help protect that. Hickson also says the advisory to not eat fish can affect outfitters and other fishermen. Fish, Wildlife and Parks address that issue. So we will continue to monitor the fish. Um, the reason that we went out there was the derailment occurred. We also found some pHs, but there's stuff above and below. And so we will continue to sample that, evaluate that. At this point, there's been no direct link to the derailment and that material. We still get asked about the, the cause of the derailment, and that is uh, something that is still uh, being decided by the Federal Railroad Administration. In Columbus, David J. MTN News. David, thank you. The National Park Service announcing yesterday a $40 million gift to expand and improve employee housing at Yellowstone National Park. The money made possible by donors will fund more than 70 modular homes to address the critical shortage of housing at the park. If you remember, the park even lost one of those houses in the historic 2022 floods, wiping the home from the bank and down the river. According to the news release, the current shortage of housing is a national issue and the result of a combination of factors, including rising property values surrounding the parks, and increasing demand for vacation rentals near those areas. Folks buying up residential homes and renting them out as Airbnbs. National Park employees living in those houses include rangers, resource staff and maintenance staff, and many other park employees. The hope is the additional homes will make it easier for Yellowstone to recruit and retain employees. And in crime news this morning, one man is dead and a woman is behind bars after a homicide near Shepherd yesterday. Yellowstone County Sheriff Mike Linder saying deputies were first dispatched to a residence on Chicago Road around 3 in the morning Wednesday for a sick or injured person. When arriving on scene, here's the details. They found an unresponsive adult man and performed life-saving procedures, but he later died at the hospital. During an examination, medical staff noticed a gunshot wound that was not readily detected by first responders. The victim is identified as 24-year-old Quade Fluckager, while 22-year-old Kennedy Agner has been arrested. She's facing charges of homicide and tampering with evidence. We'll continue to follow that. And new this morning, McKinley Elementary School is the oldest operating school in Billings and perhaps its most unique. The school was built back in 1906 and is on the National Register of Historic Places. Our Russ Riesinger takes a look with the help of two student tour guides. It's the oldest continually operating school in Billings, having stood the test of time for 118 years. I'm Mary. Hi. Hi, I'm Lauren. Nice to meet you. 
Two fourth grade students, Mary Murphy and Laura Newby, are giving me a tour of this historic school, named after the 25th president of the United States, William McKinley. These two friezes are called cherubs. One is playing the mandolin and one is playing the pipe. They don't build them like this anymore. From the fire slide to the friezes that adorn its walls, McKinley Elementary is full of history. They didn't get new bricks, but this is all from 1906, original bricks. The friezes are replicas of those found in some of the most famous museums in the world, but all now well over 100 years old themselves. There is the genius of peace holding an olive branch. The girls had to learn a lot about their school to be able to give these tours. Well, I, I did a lot of studying. I read um, some papers that um, our principal, Mr. Trahan, gave me. Brought those home and studied those for like a day. <laughs> so I put it off for like a couple of days and my okay, I need to do this. So I spent most of a Saturday just um, memorizing dates mm -hmm. and years. Besides learning a lot about history, giving the tours helps these students build confidence in public speaking and leadership. That they just get that practice of what does it sound like to present to adults, especially people we don't know. Strangers can be really challenging. So we're lucky that they're willing to, <laughs> to practice and learn and give tours too. Well, I like sharing the knowledge that I know about the school. Um, I think it's pretty fun, and I, l I liked learning about more about the artwork. In Billings, Russ Riesinger, MTN News.